Let me speak about changes in the Middle East and uh, for a change, positive changes. We are not used to hear positive news from the Middle East. And by the way, when it is positive news to some people in the Middle East, it is negative news to others in the Middle East. So let's at least discuss something that for some parties of the Middle East are also positive. We are witnessing recently a fundamental change in the regional architecture in the region. We are having the same problem we always had. I'm speaking about decades. I'm speaking about generations. But we have, for a change, a response that is somewhat more positive than what we've seen in the past. Let me start with the problem. The problem is radicalism in Muslim-majority countries. And let me be very clear here. This is not necessarily religious Muslim radicalism, namely not necessarily Islamism, but what we've seen in this region for a very long time, namely elements that are radical and they manage to disrupt other considerations of other countries who are not radical by imposing the radical way on countries that are not interested in having this as their way. And what we see now is some positive change where the radicals are being isolated and the elements that are interested more in stability are gaining uh, strengths. Let me first explain what the source of this radicalism in the region is. We see a major unbridgeable gap between the perception of people in the region of the world as it is and the world as it should have been. They have this perception and I can understand it with the glorious past of Islam and of Arabs that Arabs are destined for greatness. They've had a past of greatness and they expect greatness to visit them again. They expect to be leading elements in the world. They speak about it very, very often, but they recognize realistically, I must say, they recognize that at the moment, they are not only in a very, very deep crisis that we, we are seeing for more than 100 years in the region, but recently, even a perception of hopelessness, namely, not only the situation today is very, very bad, but it will always, not always, but probably in the near future, be not much better. And at the moment, we see very little hope in most of the countries of the Middle East, with a few exceptions that I will mention in a moment, of radicals who are trying to offer this kind of hope, but others are no longer buying. Now, what is the reason that we have this enormous gap between the expectations and the performance, between what people believe they should have and what they recognize that they don't have? I think the major reason is that for the last 100 years, particularly in Arab states, we have seen very, very little, if any, kind of nation building, society building. If you look at the Arab states since the beginning of the period where they became partially independent and then totally independent, we've seen very little progress in terms of adjusting the society to the challenges of the 20th century and later the 21st century. And we have as a result, as an inevitable result, we have a region that is structurally violent and unstable, not only in the region itself. When you take a very large number of Arabs who fled the region, went to Europe, established Arab communities in Europe, they are not integrating in the European society and they brought with them a culture, again, of violence and instability. Not all of them, but the important thing is that the minority of violent and radical elements are dictating to a very large extent the behavior 
of communities that are not essentially violent and unstable. But this is something that you can see in the region and you can see beyond the region when you speak about Arab political culture. And therefore, there is an understanding, there is a deep understanding that Arabs have failed in gaining the position in the world that they believe they deserve. And if until a decade ago, there was still a hope that you can depose the regimes who produce this backwardness and substitute them with regimes that will catapult the Arabs to the position they believe they deserve, what we have seen in the last decade, what is sometimes called the Arab Spring, is that the opposite is happening. Namely, that you have an understanding that when the society replaces the regimes, the result is either not better or sometimes worse than before. Take what happened in Syria, take what happened in Egypt, take what happened in a number of Arab states where changing the regime or changing the people on top did not produce a better situation. In Libya, for instance, it produced a situation even worse than under the dictatorship of Gaddafi. And there is the understanding that this is a perpetual failure, or at least for the immediate future, you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And against this background, you had radical regimes Gamal Abdel Nasser in uh, Egypt, the regime of the Assad family in Syria, the Iranian revolution since uh, 79, ISIS, the um, Muslim brothers throughout the region, who offer radical approaches. Some of them have already failed. Some of them, in my view, are in a process of failing. But the important thing is that until recently, the radicals managed to coerce the non-radicals to follow in their footsteps. So non-radical Arab states who did not want to pay the price of radicalism had to do it because they were afraid that if they don't do it, they will be toppled by their own people. And here is the change that we see in recent years. We see Arab states, we don't see it on the level of the Arab society at the moment, but on the political level, we see Arab states who understand that the Arabs are today so weak that they can be taken over by the Iranians and to a lesser extent by the Turks. They are frightened and should be frightened of the Iranian ambitions of regional hegemony. And they say to themselves, we can no longer pretend to be radical and to work with the radicals, because if we don't defend ourselves, we will be taken over by, by the radicals. And you have in the region different kinds of radicalism. You have Shiite radicalism that is represented primarily with the Iranian revolutionary regime, the Houthis in uh, Yemen, Hezbollah Very in much. Lebanon. And you have also Sunni radicalism that is uh, expressed in Turkey, in the Muslim brothers, in ISIS. And the change, the dramatic change, is that most Arab states recently came to the conclusion that only Israel is strong enough to fight this radicalism. And because the Israelis are not only powerful enough to do it, but also have the motivation to do it for their own good, not to do it because the Arabs have asked them to do it. But a byproduct of it will be that the Arabs can rely on the Israeli strengths in order to defend themselves against the threat of particularly Iranian takeover and hegemony, but also to a lesser extent in a more limited part of the region of the Turkish one. And now what we have is a fascinating coalition. We used to speak about, about the Middle East in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And you have the Arabs, every Arab on the one hand, and Israel on the other. What we're having today is a coalition of Israel with not only most of the Arab states, but also with the most important Arab states. And I mean 
primarily Saudi Arabia and Egypt, but also countries in the Gulf, Jordan, Morocco, and many others. You have a coalition of Israel and most Arabs against the radicalism of the Iranians on the one hand and the Turks, again, to a much lesser extent, on the other. So it is not the Arab-Israeli conflict that is the defining element in the region, and certainly not this hallucination that if you do something with the Palestinians, the Middle East will be stabilized. This is something that very few still believe. But also not the Shiite-Sunni um, difference, because if you look, for instance, at the cooperation between the Shiite Iranians and the Sunni um, uh, and the Sunni Muslim brothers in the Gaza Strip, you see that this is not the dividing line. And the problem, the most important problem, and here I want, this is the last element that I want to mention and then focus uh, on it for a short while, is that at the moment we have no American leadership because if you have American leadership to this Israeli-Arab coalition against Iran, then we would be in very good shape. But under Obama, we had this hallucination of Obama that you can stabilize the Middle East by uh, basically appeasing the radicals, particularly uh, Turkey and Iran. And again, this particular regime in Iran, this particular regime in Turkey, and bring about a Palestinian-Israeli peace, and this will stabilize the region. Now, this failed. Practically everything that Obama did in the region completely failed. And not only did it fail in what it wanted to achieve, it, only, it also brought Iranian control over Iraq, Turkish control in Syria, and Russian involvement in the Middle East because of a profound misunderstanding of uh, the region. Now, you had such... American mistakes in the past. Eisenhower in 1956 is a very good example, but Eisenhower understood that he was mistaken, changed his policies, and the Eisenhower doctrine went in the opposite direction. Obama did not understand it, but what we have now, after Trump went in an opposite direction, the most important question is now, what will Biden do? And interestingly enough, Biden is following in the footsteps of um, Obama when it comes to Iran, but he is beginning to understand that if the United States wants to leave the Middle East, and it should leave the Middle East, in order to focus on Asia, in order to pivot to Asia, then it must leave behind it this coalition that is interested in the same national interests of the United States, namely the combination primarily of Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt with most Arab states. And the Americans are beginning to understand that if they want to leave the Middle East and then not to be sucked again into the region, they must reconsider going as far as they intended to go on the Iranian issue. Let me end by quoting Winston Churchill, and I think in a very appropriate way uh, concerning the uh, situation that we are facing now. He is reported to have said, America eventually does the right thing, not before the Americans have exhausted all other options. I think that this will be true in this instance as well. Thank you. Thank you.